My name is Tracy Freck. I direct the University of Utah Systemic Sclerosis Clinic, where we serve a five-state area. Um, my story uh, in scleroderma started in 2005, and I started the clinic mainly because we had a real need for uh, local clinical trials options. Um, I would like to start as an introduction to my talk with um, explaining the scenario that is a, uh, shown here. So how many college football fans are out there? All right, so, so some, all right. So here's the University of Utah. Here's where our university hospital uh, sits. And these three lights right here is where the Utes football stadium is. And if you took a bird's eye view of the football stadium, it looked a little bit like that. Now, I don't know if anybody watched the Utah Oregon game. It was very sad, very embarrassing. So our little sweet Utah football player here ran down to the field and threw the ball down before he happened to make the touchdown. The referee did not call it a touchdown. This astute organ player says, well, wait a second. He didn't call it. He's down here dancing away, so excited he scored a touchdown, so he thinks. And the, Utah, uh, the Oregon football player runs down and in fact scores a touchdown. The Utes were horrified. What I think this really highlighted to me and kind of my introduction to the talk is oftentimes if we were going to try to describe the intricacies of what happened during that play from a bird's eye view, it would have been really impossible for us to know what in fact happened. And you needed a really close up or a microscopic view of that event to be able to describe it better. So in the course of my talk of how do we track vascular changes in the scleroderma talk, I'm going to talk about how traditionally we have used a bird's eye view to understand what's going on in the blood vessels. But really, as we progress our research and our understanding of scleroderma, we may need more of a microscopic view. And so bear with me, because there's some science slides in here that I uh, hopefully explain this analogy a little bit better. So I have no disclosures. Um, all the information that I'm presenting is just my clinical experience. It hasn't been supported by any uh, pharmaceutical industry or uh, product development. So to, the overview from my talk today is I'm going to talk about what scleroderma vasculopathy is. So when any term we use in medicine, opathy means abnormality of. And vasculo is vascular. So when we're talking about systemic sclerosis vasculopathy, we're talking about the abnormal blood vessels in a scleroderma patient. How we traditionally do that as a physician is we do a clinical assessment, and we would love to use more bedside clinical imaging. I really focus on that bedside clinical imaging because when my patients come into the clinic, what I really love is for us to be able to make a plan right then, then and there and to be able to move forward with recommendations for medications, treatments, and um, different preventative measures we can use. I will not cover different vascular imaging that we would refer off to radiology or cardiology such as an echocardiogram because it, that's been covered in other lectures. Lastly, probably why you're here, is how can we prevent this vasculopathy? It's one thing to say we know it's part of scleroderma. It's another thing to say we know how bad it is. But what I really, our goal as providers is to prevent it. So this is a slide that you're all probably real familiar with by now. This is the systemic sclerosis overview. So when we use the term scleroderma, of course, we're just saying hard skin. We can think of that as the localized scleroderma. Uh, and Dr. York did a wonderful overview talk of that yesterday on morphia and linear scleroderma. But for systemic sclerosis, we tend to define the disease by the amount of fibrosis. And we have great clinical indicators that your physician uses to determine the extent of the fibrosis. And historically, we've said there's two types of systemic scler uh, sclerosis. Sorry if I'm in your way there. Um, there's limited, in which there's not the skin fibrosis uh, in the upper arms, thighs, and abdomen. And there's diffuse, so there's more um, a, a general involvement of the skin involving the upper arms, the thighs, and the abdomen with skin thickening. And when your doctor assesses you, you there's different points on your body that's graded as mild, moderate, or severe to give you an overall modified Rondin skin score. And oftentimes, when we're talking about clinical tracking, your modified Rodin skin score and how it changes over time is one of the great indicators of where we are at uh, with disease. 
However, in the earlier phase, when there's uh, mostly puffy hands, this modified Ronin skin score is not super helpful for that very, very first visit if all we're seeing mainly is puffy hands. And so the idea becomes, well, can we do a better understanding of that early phase? Particularly if we work with the assumption that systemic sclerosis is a progressive disease of the microvasculature. And so if we're really going to focus on that early puffy hand phase, how do we best understand if this panel A is a normal skin biopsy and this is an early skin biopsy where you see lots of extra fluid interrupting that collagen, how do we best understand what's going on in the vascular at this point? And why is it important? Well, because your blood vessels play a very critical role. The, the blood cells, which are shown here, carry oxygen. And as we get into the circulation, oxygen pops off into the tissues, and then carbon dioxide or waste return and go into the blue side, return to the heart for removal. And so really the importance of the blood vessel performing its job well is essential to, in scleroderma as well as health. When this process does not occur well, then tissue can die and internal scarring as well as cutaneous or skin scarring can occur. And really the goal of most of us uh, scleroderma researchers is to figure out how to prevent hands that look puffy from becoming contracted. So that's the ultimate goal is an early diagnosis and an early treatment. Well, oftentimes when I get to this point with my talking to different students, they say, well, why do rheumatologists own scleroderma? Why don't I go to a vascular doctor? And the main reason, as many of you uh, well know, is blood tests frequently result in your referral to a rheumatologist. And so autoantibodies um, are many in the scleroderma family, and this is borrowed by, uh, a slide borrowed from Tom Medsker but help us understand what certain features of disease we may see. So they help us sort of understand both from a diagnostic standpoint. So yes, we do believe that you have systemic sclerosis because you have this autoantibody. And these are the things I'm gonna think about with a little bit more detail if you have that particular type of autoantibody. However, you may realize your doctor doesn't track this autoantibody over time. So you get the initial test and you're diagnosed and it's not something that, that we think as, as changing or being critical for the progression of your disease. And furthermore, shown here in the ACR Euler criteria that help us classify scleroderma, just having that autoantibody and only three are, are really recognized only gives you three points towards a nine points necessary for a diagnosis. So why the big red box? Because what I think this newer, newer criteria in 2013 really highlight is there's less focus necessarily on fibrosis and more focus on some of the vascular changes that again are designed to help us make earlier diagnoses. So in the red box, we see fingertip lesions and you get a certain number of points. And again, we're going to that nine point diagnosis, but we see that you can have a digital ulcer or a digital pits, which are shown there. You can have telangiectasias, which are the, the red spots that are shown on these hands. You can have abnormal capillaroscopy or cap capillaries. And if this is the nail, here's your nail bed. And then the capillaries are these little loops of blood vessels that come up there. And so an abnormal capillaroscopy gives you two points. Pulmonary arterial hypertension, um, would, uh, which is diagnosed by echocardiogram, abnormalities followed up with a right heart cath, is, is uh, put here with a two point score. And then you have your Raynaud's phenomenon, which you all are uh, familiar with shown there. So really a newer focus on understanding the vascular side of scleroderma. So how does that translate to our clinical practice? Well, first of all, before we talk about the procedures, let's just do some overview on the, the cardiovascular basics. So your cardiovascular system transports nutrients, oxygen, and hormones to different parts of the body, and is critical for removing waste from metabolism and toxins like we showed in that initial picture. But really, um, where I, I think the understanding of what role these autoantibodies may play 
um, becomes important, is it protects the body with components of the immune system. So that's how our immune system cells get to where they need to, do, to be. They're transported in the different blood vessels as well as it's critical for regulating t body temperature, fluid, and water contents of all our cells. So some very important and um, obviously um, interesting aspects of the vascular system when we think about scleroderma. But if we look at that big diagram, I don't think it does it justice. So what, when we see the big red blood vessels, we're talking about um, vessels with smooth muscle large vessels. But what about where the actual exchange is occurring? So in your capillaries, the blood vessel lining cells are just one cell thick. This is a very, very high magnification image called electron microscopy of looking at a blood vessel. And what basically you can see is there's a red blood cell here. And what its job is, is to provide the exchange of oxygen from the surrounding tissues of the blood vessel lining cell and respond and give us um, get to remove the waste products. And so here it is in diagram function, and there is a real live view. However, as the blood flows through this blood vessel, different pressures are necessary to allow that exchange to work just right. And so understanding the microcirculation at a very fine uh, level of imaging, that microscopic view, likely is important. And one of the things we noticed when we did a series of electron microscopy on skin biopsies is that there is a lot of reactive changes to these, these cells. They had multiple different layers of their basement membrane, and they looked very stressed out. And so that gave us the idea of let's figure out a little bit with more detail of what that stress to those cells mean? Well, I, I told you the, the title of the talk is, is bedside uh, monitoring, so I, I promised I wasn't going to get too much in detail on all the assays we use to better define those different basement membranes. So let's talk about how, when you come to clinic, we can translate those very different changes we're seeing, that lining of that cell, to what, when you leave that clinic visit and say, okay, I understand the status of my blood vessels, where I'm at. The first is quite obvious, it's vital signs, but I say obvious, and we'll get in the next couple slides how many times we can mess this up and not do it quite correctly. Your doctor should always look for digital ulcers, mainly because those can get infected, and I like to give a lot of instruction to my patients. If you've had a digital ulcer, you're at risk of further digital ulcers, and knowing how to treat those, how you're, um, how to, who to call and when antibiotics are indicated are really important conversations to have with your physician. I'd love to have a slide, this is how you do it, but it varies a little bit per physician. So I say having that conversation with your physician about if you have a digital ulcer and how to deal with it is a very important conversation to have. Nail full capillaroscopy, we'll talk a little bit about that and I'll show you some pictures. My interest, if you went to my talk yesterday, um, is really understanding the gastrointestinal tract and those symptoms and how we can do a better job understanding how blood flow gets to the gut and how we're doing with the different treatments we're using. And then lastly, um, if you went to my talk yesterday, I really am a firm believer in questionnaires, and I pass these out a lot in uh, clinic. So the one I talked about yesterday was the Sclerodema Clinical Trials Consortium Gastrointestinal Tract 2.0. And this is a, a questionnaire I pass out every single clinic visit. And you may say, well, well I get kind of fatigue, because I know a lot of my patients do. Oh, those questionnaires, you give me a stack of them, and I feel like I'm just questionnaire after questionnaire. But where I really stress them is it helps us understand your symptoms. And for me, the most important thing when you leave the room is I address what was on your agenda, that your symptoms or your concerns were are addressed. And sometimes with the unfortunate, the 20 minutes, you know, you know, someone's knocking on the door, you're, you're late, you're late, you're late. We don't do as a good of job of asking those extensive questions without questionnaires, because I will always take those and look at them at the end and be able to, to make sure that if I didn't talk about it in the clinic, I can call you and we can address something that wasn't, wasn't necessarily discussed. And so I, this is my plug-in for if you can be in a research study or you can fill out a questionnaire, it helps us do a better job. And so I encourage you to fill those out. More importantly, on the flip side, if I find that little vascular lesion, I'm doing all this fancy electron microscope, but it doesn't cause you a symptom and you're no worse for the wear for it, then it's really not important and I shouldn't waste your time um, in, in trying to investigate it further.
So those are our clinical bedside tools, and I, I said we oftentimes mess up with blood pressure. So I'll tell you kind of a cute story. I, I organize all the speakers for the Scoderma Foundation, our local um, group, and I get a list, and I said, what do you guys want to listen to this year? And this was, this is, I'm going to say eight years ago, one of, um, someone said, I want to know how you do blood pressure correctly. And so I said, okay, I'll prepare that talk. And to my horror, we were not doing it correctly in our scleroderma clinic. So um, oftentimes, we, you know, the, you have to understand things change and things change rapidly. And what I hadn't realized is that the internal medicine, that internal medicine as an organization, has really moved away from oscillatory blood pressures. And so oftentimes, if the machine was tied up in a different room, the nurse would come in and just do traditional blood pressure. Now, I'm not going to disparage any clinician who does doesn't have an automated blood pressure cuff. But I do think it's important to be aware of, after I realized that, I said, well, let me see how bad it is. So I did a series of studies looking at patients and saying, are we, is, is the automated pre, um, cuff better than the oscillatory cuff? And it is because of something called an oscillatory gap in which our ears don't hear stiff blood vessels as well. And with scleroderma, we, some of the changes that occur in the blood vessels can make the blood vessels a little stiff. So the way it's supposed to be determined is you have the cuff placed. The the um, if if this is an oscillatory manager uh, management, the uh, bell is placed. It's um, inflated to above 30 millimeters uh, before there's no until there's no sound, and then by two to three millimeters per mercury it decreases. And when they hear the first sound, that's your systolic number, and when they the sound disappears, that's your diastolic number. And really, the, the, that, that pressure should be recorded. Now, if you're having oscillatory blood pressure measurements in your clinic and you're given a number, you may want to, to um, advise the different people who are taking your blood pressure on some of the things that, that need to be done. And again, this really was eye-opening in my own clinic. You should empty your bladder and your bowel 30 minutes before you get your blood pressure um, tested. And you should be rested at least five minutes. Now raise your hand if you regularly, when you go to the doctor, you're allowed to sit there at peace and rest for five minutes. Exactly, so that's the same as in my clinic. And why do we care? Because that can increase that top number about 12 points and the bottom number about uh, six. Um, oftentimes, people are sit up, sat on the exam table. You're in a rush. Nope, you're supposed to be in that seat, uh, in a seat with your back support, resting for five minutes until your blood pressure is checked, and that could increase it. So now we're up to possibly 20 millimeters of mercury abnormal pressure if we're not doing it correctly. Your legs should be uncrossed. Your arms should be bare. And I'll say in Utah during the winter, this one I sometimes, you know, I say, okay, you can wear a thin shirt because it's so cold in those rooms. But really, bare arm is necessary. So, so making sure when you go to the doctor's office, wearing a short sleeve shirt, because they don't oftentimes take the time to put you in a gown, can help get you a more accurate re read. It should be at a, at the right cuff for your arm circumference. And so oftentimes they, there's a rush and there's a one size fit all cuff. And that really should be changed based on the size of your arm circumference. And then where the cuff is placed and whether your arm is supported are all important things that can influence the blood pressure. This is my favorite because I, my, I, have, I love my medical assistants. They're fantastic and they absolutely love my scleroderma clinic. So they're so excited to chit chat and say, oh my goodness, where, how's your daughter doing? And I'll walk in and I'll say, oh, we can't talk during blood pressure. And so just oftentimes you have to remind the person taking your blood pressure, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not supposed to talk while we're doing it. So I do this talk mostly so that you have this very busy slide, which normally I wouldn't put this many words on it, but in your handout. So you, when you go to the doctor, you can do your best to get that accurate read. Now I get lots of questions about, okay, what do you guys use? So we use an Omron cuff um, uh, in our clinic. And what the Omron cuff does is it takes three measurements, throws out the first and averages the two. And so what, why I love it is you're placed, you're, you're placed in the room and you're sitting there and I actually ask my medical assistants when they're using the cuff to leave the room. So there's um, that relaxed atmosphere. A lot of you may get anxious when you're at the doctor. You don't know what they're gonna say, if they're gonna change the medications, you were rushed in there. And so this is the best way I have found to get a more accurate read. 
Um, but be aware if your age is over 65, you have diabetes, or you get really dizzy upon standing, those are important things to, co to comment to your physician so that there can be additional reads done if one of the numbers is not quite accurate. There's a real push in to doing automated home blood pressure monitoring as opposed to doctor office uh, monitoring. And um, over age 65, they've increased some of the parameters for our blood pressure tolerance because of all the errors that were coming out of the clinics. So we're falsely treating elevated blood pressure. Now you may say, well, she spent a lot of time, how do we track blood pressure in clinic? And she's going on and on about blood pressure. But if you ask me, this is one of those bird's eye views that is critical for scleroderma patients to understand. The main reason, of course, is patients who are at risk for scleroderma renal crisis. We want you to know how to track your blood pressure, how to, how to feel comfortable knowing where you run and how, how your cuff is working. But also, even if you never have a scleroderma renal crisis, it's a good idea to know how, where your blood pressure runs because it's a risk for heart attack and stroke. And so getting familiar with checking your blood pressure and feeling comfortable helps. Now my mother, who has hypertension, says to me, oh, I hate that cuff, it makes me so anxious. I don't ever want to use it. But I have found that if you check it more regularly and you get used to it and keep that log, you eventually get over that anxiety. Um, and I can say finally she was able to bring a blood pressure log to her primary care provider, which was my request. And make sure if you are checking your blood pressure, you bring that log to your, your appointments because your doctor does want to know. You can also actually bring the cuff so they can equilibrate it and make sure that it's, it's running adequately or accurately in comparison to theirs. But, you know, can we move beyond blood pressure for scleroderma? I started by saying, you know, what really my interest is understanding that, that microscopic view of what's going on at that vascular level. And because Raynaud's is a uh, universal feature in scleroderma, and when it's quite severe and, and not adequately treated, we can have very bad outcomes with critical digital ischemia or infarcts to the fingers and digital ulcers. The idea really is for us as a community to treat this better so we don't have to worry about that. And what one of the modalities I've been interested in is trying to figure out, can I monitor that vascular progression in clinic? And can I tell if I'm gonna give you, especially a really expensive vasodilator, is it working? Is it doing a good enough job? So again, the questionnaires become extremely helpful because if you say, I feel better on this medication, that means a lot to me. My hands don't hurt as much, but I sure as heck like, would like to have some very good, um, results that I could show you in clinic. Now, I don't think any of my patients are here, but this is somebody, uh, this is something I've been using in clinic very regularly. It's called flow media dilation. And I don't expect that you have this in your scleroderma centers, but the point I'd like to make is it may be something that can be, provide additional information. And certainly it helps us with that understanding of what's probably going on in scleroderma vasculopathy. So for this procedure, you can see the blood pressure cuff is actually placed on the forearm. This is an ultrasound probe. So the same sort of probe that's used for echocardiograms or ultrasounds of fetuses. And so it's, it's placed here and, and uh, right over the brachial artery. We prepare our subjects as best as, as possible. Um, we obtain two baseline measurements. And so we look, we put that ultrasound probe on, we measure the size of the vessel and how well the blood is flowing. So two pretty simple measurements. We then occlude the cuff. And then when we release it, we measure how well the blood vessel dilates or expands and how well the blood restores its flow. So it's a pretty simple measurement. And then all the software does all the fancy um, calculations and where the edge quite uh, is. And it then takes into account what the baseline abnormalities were and how it responds. So when we did this in a series of scleroderma patients, we found some interesting things. So firstly, we looked at healthy controls and the Utah Vascular Research Lab was very, very nice to me. I begged and pleaded and said, can you please help me with this project? I need gender and age match controls that are not on any medications. And so they said, we were well, happy to help you. And they provided all these patients for my scleroderma patients. And it was honestly just people who were coming to clinic. So I would come in, they'd set up, we'd, we'd just 
part of your routine clinic visit, we'd measure how well your blood flow was going. And I'd go to the Utah Vascular Research Lab and they'd call somebody and bring someone in. And so what we found, now when we use a p-value, less than 0.05 is significant. So this is getting there, and this is really significant. We found that despite our patients being on um, adequate therapies to try to vasodilate when they were when they were appropriate therapy, so calcium channel blockers like amlodipine or nifedipine for Raynaud's, phosphodiesterase inhibitors like Tadalafil or Rivadio, endothelin receptor antagonists like Treclair or prostacyclin analogs like Iloprost. These medications were for pulmonary arterial hypertension. These could be for pulmonary arterial hypertension or Raynaud's. They were just part of standard care. And when we look at these patients, we were doing a pretty good job with getting blood flow where it needed to go. So that may suggest, okay, the medications we're using work or have a, have a, are doing a good thing. However, we also found quite significantly that even with all this flow, the vessels were smaller. And so the question becomes, was the blood flow increased because the blood vessels were really small? <laughs> so it's trying to push more blood through a smaller um, um, orifice. Or were these medications, in fact, truly working? And that becomes an important question because these medications are expensive. So we'd like some evidence that when we're giving them to, for Raynaud's that they're, it's, it's working well. So here's the rest of it. So we have our little ultrasound probe on there. We get our two baseline measurements, how well the blood flow is flowing through and how, um, how wide that diameter. We occluded the cuff, so it goes back. This is the blood flow, and then we release it. And when we release the cuff, we look at something called peak hyperemia, and that's that blood vessel lining cell. So do you remember the electron micro microscopy image? And it had that tiny little cell. That's a measure of this. It tells us how well that blood lining cell is doing its job. Well, gosh, it didn't react as well as we'd like it to. He was a little sluggish to wake up after not getting a blood flow to him. And furthermore, if we corrected it for all the baseline abnormalities, because if, if you remember, the scleroderma vessels were different than the healthy controls. When we looked at it, it still, it didn't dilate as well as we want. So now we have kind of two clues. The blood vessel lining cells not doing its job as well as it should be, and the vessel is not e able to dilate or expand itself as well as we'd like it. And a lot of our, again, our medications we're using are trying to tell that blood vessel, dilate, get some blood flow to where it needs to go. Well, you may say to me, well, this isn't really that helpful, Tracy. You know, we know scleroderma patients are different than healthy controls. You haven't really told me anything that's very exciting yet or that anything that, that useful. Well, here is where we then found it to be a little bit more interesting is what we want to do when you come to clinic is tell you, yeah, you may be at risk for a digital ulcer, so we really want to pay close attention to you and make sure we're doing every preventative measure that we possibly can for your fingers. So we looked at our patients that had digital ulcers and no digital ulcers, and um, we and said, okay, well, their baseline flow is about the same. They're on similar medications. They had about the same diameter of, of um, their, their arteries. When you released the blood pressure cuff, their endothelial blood vessel lining cells were about as reactive. But here where it is really interesting is people that develop digital ulcers really couldn't dilate as well. And so we may be able to dissect out a little bit, maybe it's not just that blood vessel lining cell not doing its job, but the ability of our larger vessels, those smooth vessel lined vessels, to um, dilating as well. So these are the two, and again, it's reaching statistical significance. We like it thus in 0.05, but this is how science always is. You almost get there. Um, but the, we decided to follow this up with a little bit more uh, details because I want to know why can't scleroderma blood vessels dilate well, and what can I do to make those better? Furthermore, we followed some patients over time, so they just come to clinic, and as long as the vascular research folks were willing to sit in my clinic with their ultrasound probe, um, we just track patients over time. And these are just um, scleroderma feature, these three patients looked on paper exactly the same. So same disease duration, same autoantibody, really looks very similar, came back to clinic, and if someone had the same blood flow and the same ability to react to that when they got no blood flow to that digit, um, and then the, measure the overall ability of that blood vessel to expand, 
the patient that was the lowest on all those me measurements just happened to develop a digital ulcer during that course of, of clinic follow-up. So it really kind of sent a message to me is when I have someone who comes to our visit and has very low measurements, that's someone I really want to pay a lot of attention to for digital ulcer prevention. And we're, again, I, I'm, we're investigating this at, um, very actively to see whether this flow media dilation is a good tool for us to predict digital ulcers and, and then hopefully for prevention. Now again, you may not have this in your clinic. I mean, the, the, it's, a, it's a cumbersome machine. It takes time. Um, but the two points, again, I want to make is, firstly, if you are offered the ability to participate in just an observational study, please do it. Because it, it helps us understand natural history of disease. And the second point is, I hope that we do start to find that this is a way to predict and becomes more of a standard of care um, to, uh, tool that we can use. So nextly, what about nail fold caplaroscopy? So has anyone had nail fold caplaroscopy? Raise your hand if you have. I was hoping everybody raised their hand, and I'll explain why. I brought devices to look at caplaroscopy. Before I get too excited, you'll listen to the rest of the story. Because um, I, I did it I did it last year at the, at the conference, and it was a hit. People loved it. And um, I have three different devices. The last one was in Anaheim, which I could drive from Salt Lake City. I couldn't drive from Salt Lake City to Nashville, so I settled on only bringing one device. Sat down on the plane, hooked up my laptop to practice my talks, dead keyboard. So I made an appointment. I said, no problem. I've got two days to the talk. There was a Mac store over in Green Hall Mall. I took a cab ride to Green Hall, made my appointment, feeling pretty good about it. But he, he said, well, just buy the, you know, it's just your keyboard, buy the plug-in, got that, buy yourself a mouse. Bought those, got back to the hotel room. Oops, there's only two USB drives. So now I've used them both, so I can't get in the Microsoft and the software. So I tried, is my story, to do this for you, because I think it's fun. But you know, it, the other thing is, if you really like the idea, make sure you fill out that, oh, we wish there was a caplaroscopy course. But I think this is, this is kind of fun for you all, to look at your caplaroscopy. So let me explain why it's, why it's interesting. So anywhere else in our skin, our blood vessels come up to the skin like this. And so you get a pinhole view of, of the capillaries. In the body, there's very few places where, it, where suddenly those vessels turn route and allow us to look at them in great detail and put a nice microscope up and look to see the great detail of what those blood vessels are doing. So I find it very interesting to look at my patient's different capillaroscopy abnormalities because for me it kind of helps me feel like I'm doing a good job if I've seen some healing or they're not progressing and I like to quantify and we'll talk a little about what that means. But when we, for bottom, bottom line is your doctor may have only done it once because caplaroscopy is part of that diagnostic criteria. And if you remember, it doesn't get into all this fancy talk. It says, is it normal or is it abnormal? And you get two points, it's abnormal. What is some of the things that, that can be abnormal is you can see dilation of loops. You can see little blood clots, which we call microhemorrhage. Or you can see something called neoangiogenesis, where the blood vessels are trying to grow back and they form these bushy little appearances. And so your doctor may just use um, just bedside tools, such as an otoscope or ophthalmoscope, to just get a magnification and take a look. They may use a stereo microscope, or they may use this dyno light. Or, even better yet, there's a, derm there's a dermos dermatoscope you can pop on your iPhone and you can take pictures of, of um, caplaroscopies and sometimes people are doing that nowadays. But it's a way for us to look at that microvascular change over time. So here is a normal. This is, of course, is a lot more helpful when you're going to come up here and I was going to look at your catharoscopy. But all for the cases, uh, for this case, I'll just explain it. We're going to see about nine to fourteen really skinny vessels. So I'm going to point here, here, here. There come nice hairpin loops, and they come back around. That's that would be normal. Now. I mentioned that we're real interested in, in moving the field forward. So less of normal versus abnormal and more in well, what is abnormal and how, what signals does that tell us? Does that give us a microscopic view? So I have the great privilege and pleasure of working with the Prospective Registry of Early Systemic Sclerosis. This is a group of investigators at 11 different institutions in the nation that said, let's work together and when we're talking about different changes. Let's make sure we're all on the same page. And so we're a group of investigators that meet together quite regularly 
and make sure when we're examining a patient that, that we are talking the same language. And one of the things we really like to do as a group is better understand what micro hemorrhage dilated loop and neoangiogenesis means. And do we think it's mild, moderate, or severe? And so these are some of the features that, that we're trying to move the field forward in that capillaroscopy. Um, and really, it takes, it's pretty quick. It's eight fingers. And, but there can be some challenges um, if there's a hand contracture. But otherwise, we found it this to be really quite an interesting way to track blood vessel changes over time. Now, this is also more fun if I can pull your, let you look at these while we're examining your nail folds. But here, these are some images I took from the press capillaroscopy database. These are my patients. Um, micro hemorrhages are little blood clots. And so some people have evidence of lots of little blood clots, but normal size and shape. Other folks have lots of these um, uh, regrowths of blood vessels. So, it, so they're really trying to grow new blood vessels. And then there can be different varying of dilated loops. So the loops can be kind of mildly dilated. So a normal is kind of is very narrow. This looks mildly dilated as it's looping back. Moderately, it's a little bit larger. And severe takes on um, really the shape before it starts growing in a new blood vessel. So this really highlights is probably the microscopic view of what's going on in a scleroderma blood vessel varies a little in these different presentations. And so as your doctor looks and examines you, really getting a clear clinical picture of what's driving disease becomes uh, important. Well, moving on um, to some other areas we can look in more detail, this is um, uh, one of my uh, passions is trying to figure out the gastrointestinal tract. And let me explain why. I feel helpless, and doctors hate to feel helpless. You've come to me for advice, and I want to make you feel better. And the gut always seems that we just do a physical exam. We don't, and we fill out some questionnaires, and we're not understanding what's driving disease as well as I wish we could. Well, one of the things that I've really been interested in, in is the oral changes of the mouth. And, and in particularly, um, while that makes chewing difficult, um, there also are some changes that occur underneath the tongue. And we said, okay, well, if we, if we know these are occurring, we should probably score them over time in the same way we do microvascular changes of the nail fold and be able to say, is that change underneath the tongue? Is there a change in thickness, length? Um, does it look like their blood vessels are, are changing? And so if you raise the tip of your tongue to your mouth, a lot of patients say, yeah, I did notice that. My, my tongue underneath, my tongue has changed. And what we then decided to do is say, okay, if it's changing, what's causing it to change? And so we took, we took a camera and we just took a picture of underneath the tongue. Um, we then took this probe um, and looked and measured how well blood flow is, is going underneath the tongue. And, you, and uh, I don't have a, a healthy control comparison, and I'm sure you're probably not used to looking underneath tongues, but I can assure you these have different features that, are not, that would not be seen in someone that has a completely healthy mouth. And what we found is if we measure the blood flow, it seems to decrease with disease duration. And when we do those questionnaires, that total gastrointestinal tract 2.0 score, that when we look at bloating and reflux and diarrhea and soilage and a social constipation, emotional um, components, that perhaps some of the symptoms correlate with the, the severity of symptoms correlate with decrease in blood flow. And so we are really interested in taking this further. Then, of course, like all things in research, you have to hit lots of roadblocks. I go to my good friends from the research vascular lab. I say, okay, you did it before. Let's do it again. Give me age and gender match controls. And we're going to repeat all this, and we're going to show that this is true. Well, it turns out the imaging, even though visually it looked different, using this little device that my husband bought me from my birthday, um, using this little lovely device um, didn't really work so well when looking at a healthy control. The, me the measurements weren't that different. So maybe it would help 
over time in an individual. But I wasn't able to give you a score when you left the room. This is how different you are from healthy control, and that's what you want. Not to mention, if you happen to be really cold that day and you're not getting a lot of blood flow, if it varies a little, what does that mean? So again, this is probably one of my best examples of um, lots of investment of energy and expense <laughs> for very little. But then it brought me to it, you know, like everything, you can't say, oh, I give up. Okay, are there better imaging techniques that we can use to understand that blood flow? Enter sublingual capillaroscopy. So this is another kind of fortuitous um, experience I had. Um, I work in a lab, I do some, some uh, vascular research, and the head of the lab said, we have these guys coming with this camera today and I don't have time to meet with them. Can you please, please, please sit down with these guys, just listen to their spiel and then, and then they'll be on their way. And so they pull out this sublingual imaging and they're like, oh, you know, we're interested in sepsis. We're looking at patients that have vascular leak. And um, that was a vascular research lab. That's where they were approaching them. And we have this really fancy camera and we've developed all this software. And basically what we, we can do is tell you how different the blood flow underneath your tongue is to someone who's totally healthy. I kid you not. And I'm like, oh, really? I've been doing this for like the last two years. <laughs> so I said, oh, oh, really? And he said, yeah. And you just get this little histogram that you can give to the patient a number of well perfused vessels, total number of vessels, and it gives you this little score. So I said, okay, that, that's really quite interesting. And I just happened to have an IRB already approved to study blood flow underneath the tongue. So why don't we take this to the clinic and, and, and take a look at it? And so at this point, I'm just collecting data over time, but it looks somewhat promising like capillaroscopy for us to understand changes to the gut and its correlation to the severity of GI tract symptoms. And that kind of makes sense if you think about it. Um, I had a picture in my slide set from yesterday, but the gut lining cells look like little fingers. In the same way that we have renodes of our fingers, we probably have renodes of our guts. And so trying to understand how well we're doing with perfusion of the gut is likely uh, important. But that's, so that's the, the sort of how we're tracking. And again, I didn't want you to be disappointed and say, well, okay, there's lots of fancy tools and my doctor doesn't have them. And, but it's more so, hey, isn't this exciting? We're finally making progress in the right direction of understanding what's going on. And there's great national collaborations amongst physicians so that we're all on the same page. So I think it's exciting from that standpoint. But really what's probably most important for you all and is, is vasculopathy prevention. So the one thing we have that automatically makes our blood vessels dilate is exercise. So exercise is one of those things that actually should be more important than any prescription you take. And the reason is, is if we truly believe vasculopathy drives fibrosis, and we have a natural way to dilate our blood vessels and improve perfusion, we should be doing a really good job of encouraging you to exercise. But I'll be honest, I never want to be a hypocrite. So when I get home at the end of the day, I'm really tired. And I, you know, I sort of, you know, say, oh, I don't have time. And so for one New Year's, I said, I'm really sick of being a hypocrite, saying, like, you should exercise all day long, saying this. And then I get home, I'm like, oh, I can't do it. But I can say, even the laziest person, yours truly, can sit on an exercise bike on an impact of one and watch the news or something for 10 to 15 minutes. And you'll be surprised how once you start doing it, if you tell yourself it only has to be an impact of one and it only needs to be for 10 minutes, then you actually will do it. As opposed to if you say, oh, I just, oh, I'll run three miles tomorrow. You know, you keep putting it off. But exercise, if you can train yourself to three, start with three, but preferably five times a week, getting in the routine of doing some form of exercise, that's the very best thing we can do for vasculopathy prevention. Healthy diet. Healthy diet's a challenge. And I, that was my talk yesterday, sort of how do we feed the sick gut? When you feel sick, how do you, how do you keep nutrients up and how do you make sure you're, you're eating healthy? So there, there is no perfect diet for scleroderma, but trying to make sure you discuss with your doctor that about your cholesterol, your blood sugar, those are, those are important overall facts that are definitely true for every patient on vascular health. And so if you haven't had your cholesterol checked or you don't know where your blood sugar runs, those are two starting points, I think, for understanding how, what diets you should be following. Track your blood pressure. So I spent some time talking about that, and you really should see a shift in your primary care provider's office of these home ambulatory blood pressure monitoring. 
Be the expert, be proactive, talk to your physician about, I want to know where my blood pressure runs and what, what cuff can I use. The Omron cuff, I don't have any backing by any. I like that one because Walgreens usually gives a rebate. So, um, and, I, and I did, when I used to give a blood pressure talk, uh, cuff talk and I gave out a free cuff, but that was a different talk. Maybe next year we'll put that in with the, the capillaroscopy. Um, but by all seriousness, every scleroderma patient should own a cuff um, and know where their blood pressure runs. No tobacco use. Now that's a hard one for some people, and I understand. You, know, you have a chronic illness, and it's sometimes a source of comfort. But if you think about what's driving this disease is unhappy blood vessels, do everything in your power to make your blood vessels happier. And then stress management. And I, I always say, you know, if I've ever made you stressed out in your clinic visit, then I failed. Because really when you come to clinic, we should have an open conversation about where our plan, where are we going? And there should never, you should never leave the clinic feeling stressed out because that's not good for your health. And so ask those questions, make sure you understand what your overall plan is. And certainly don't let the diagnosis of scleroderma be a source of stress, mainly because I think hopefully this is highlighted, there's lots of great things that will be coming. And so really focusing, I, if anyone went to do, um, Dr. Coney's opening speech, I loved her talk. I think putting your, your faith and hope and having a sense of control over this disease is absolutely essential. So please do pay attention to stress management. And then my last final plug for fill out questionnaires, I really wish I had one of my patients here to, to sort of say whether, you know, because they, they'll roll their eyes and they're like, oh my gosh, not another one. I said, but it really helps me know what we're doing. And all the research I've ever done came from the clinic. It came from people telling me this is bothering me or this we're not doing a good job on this and it had me thinking of something else. So that's my plug for, for that. Let me see. I think that is our last slide. So in summary, vascular symptoms are common. Know how to recognize them in you. Really, we don't have a clear understanding of the microvasculopathy. And we're just moving from a bird's eye view to a more of a microscopic. And I think you'll start seeing more tools used in clinic and more studies obtained to better understand that blood, what's going on at the blood vessel level. Proper measurement teaks are critical. So both in the blood pressure monitoring examples, all the things that could go wrong and throw off your blood pressure, as well as my sad example of my expensive tool <laughs> that I tried my darndest to, to try to use it and help provide meaningful information. Really knowing when you're getting a study, what is it supposed to show you and why does it matter? And if I do this, how will it change? Are good questions for you to ask. So I, I try to never order a study unless I really think it's gonna change my management or help you make a decision. Um, ease of measurement is an important consideration. Um, I will tell you, um, there's a project I just put in um, for the American College of Rheumatology with a, a student. And I, because I get really excited, I say, oh, you know, capillaroscopy is the wave of the future. We've got to get out there to our primary care physicians so they take their Raynaud's patients seriously. Because you're going to go to your primary care provider and say, my fingers are changing a little bit of color. And what I'd love that primary care provider to do is to put some gel on that finger and take a look and say normal or abnormal. So I took, I took a slide set and I gave it to the student and, I, and we had all these primary care physicians. She, she contacted this very kind of neat algorithm. She'd um, get them when they were not so busy that they would blow her off but not totally relaxed. So the middle of regular clinical practice on time. And she'd show them the image and she'd say, is this abnormal or normal? And so she did it for 20 different providers and she showed them the images. <laughs> and they were abysmal. So they couldn't tell normal from abnormal. And not only that, she said, okay, well, if you think it's abnormal, do you think there's microhemis? Do you think there's a dilated loop? She had like three slides just like you guys got, like these are abnormal. Do you, what do you think? And only seven of the people decided to take it to the next level they, to, and decide. They're like, oh, I don't know. It's just, it's just you know, it's, it's just, um, I think it's abnormal. And so um, one of the things I think this highlights is, is if you go to a primary care provider um, or you know of someone who has Raynaud's and they're not getting capillaroscopy, um, it, it may, you may need them to go to a rheumatologist to have that procedure done. And hopefully there'll be better st standardized data interpretation that comes through um, the rheumatology field as the prospective registry of scleroderma is trying to do to make this a better procedure. 
Um, and then more, most importantly in conclusion, vasculopathy prevention. So make healthy lifestyle choices, know how to track your blood pressure, and know um, that your concerns are very important to your physician. So communicate when you have any questions, those are regarding how your digital ulcers or renos are doing. Those are all things that are, that are important for, for um, a patient with scleroderma. I, oops, I'm sorry, I'd like to acknowledge um, the Scleroderma Foundation who has provided funding for the Prospective Registry of Early Systemic Sclerosis. That's this group of wonderful folks I feel privileged and honored to work with um, for my Scleroderma patients who I believe is an absolute honor and privilege to take care of. They are absolutely the best people um, uh, I can't imagine uh, taking care of a better group of, of folks, and I, I really feel like I, I dedicated my life and my career to a very meaningful cause because of them. My patients make me motivated to write those grants and to play with those different instruments because I do think that together we can definitely make a difference and move forward. This is the clinical care um, team that, that does the, all the biospecimens. These guys hung out in my clinic, and I give my patients the credit for that. I said, just come to one clinic. And they came, they're like, you have the nicest patients. Okay, we'll come back next week. So it's really, it was not me that they were helping. It was just they got to know my patients and, and felt a, a sense of, of we can, you know, I think we can figure this disease out. Got them excited at the, the Utah Vascular Research Lab. Microvascular solutions were let me play with that sublingual camera. They're going to probably make me buy it at some point. So <laughs> that's kind of sad. But as of now, they're letting me just look at, use it in clinic. Um, and then um, I, the other funding sources, I do a lot of work work at the um, VA hospital for our veterans and the rural health outreach in Montana and um, Idaho. And so these guys are, are kind of enough to, to um, allow me to have two days over there to do telehealth outreach for, for scleroderma patients. So